Hello there, you are listening to KPCALP 103.3 FM and you can always catch us at kpca.fm for live streaming capabilities. You are here with uh, DG the 30 something and the show is State of the Union. Um, I know that my uh, viewership has been going up so I want to start by saying that this is a nonpartisan um, policy-based show. So uh, I cover a lot of topics that, um, uh, you know, uh, address the country locally, you know, uh, and I try to keep it on a policy-based. So I always encourage people, um, if you are watching on Facebook, uh, to uh, keep your questions uh, more objective than subjective. And then, of course, if you have comments, you can comment as you see fit. Um, I am waiting for my other device to come alive, and then I'll be able to see all of your comments. So um, we have a, I shouldn't say just we here, all of us have a local election coming up. Uh, and um, these are elections that have really low voter turnouts. Uh, a lot of people vote in the presidential election without any kind of recognition for the fact that uh, these local officials actually affect us quite a bit, especially at the uh, city and county level. So uh, in lieu specifically of the Petaluma local elections coming up, I am going to address some, uh, I'm going to start with some data, but then it's going to be more of a commentary. Usually my shows like a little bit more of an analysis of policy. But uh, in this show, I would like to have more of a, a commentary. I've lived in Petaluma for the most part for over 22 years. And so I've seen the city change quite a bit over that time. So, uh, and I am also going to be interviewing um, on my show, I'm gonna be inviting the mayoral candidates as well as the city council candidates. And I'm, uh, so there's obviously one seat for mayor, three seats for city council up. I think as of now, we have two people running for mayor and between six and seven running for city council. I'm going to see if I can also do school board because I know that's also something that is really important to people. So stay tuned. I'll keep you in tune. Um, people have asked me. I am going to start inviting people in um, for these interviews in July, but the uh, application period doesn't end until August. So I will keep inviting people in to do that. So, and again, stay tuned for those shows. I'm going to give way more information. I am going to be setting up a full shop to make sure that uh, we can get some questions answered from the public um, and get that all set up. So that's why it was really important to me at this point to hold this show so that I could give a little bit of my commentary before we get all that done. So I am not going to, I have to say, a <laughs> little, I like to give little tidbits about myself. So I handwrite all of my notes. Um, it helps me remember a lot more of the information. I've been that way since I was in college. I, I prefer to handwrite any sort of notes. I would actually, uh, at UC Santa Barbara, most everything was in PowerPoint and I would actually go back through all of the PowerPoints that were printed and handwrite notes in my own voice. So I had I think I finally started getting rid of them, but I actually would have these 10 page handwritten, you can see if you're watching on TV, can't really see the text, handwritten. I would have these uh, 10 page handwritten semester test review sheets uh, that I would go over and over and it helps me remember things. So I brought that up because I did all of my notes and then I left them in my office in Mendocino County. <laughs> so when I got to town, I had to, uh, scurry through and write everything down I could remember. So uh, luckily all the statistics are from the census, census and I have a knack for remembering uh, data. So I, some of the numbers are rounded. I will admit that I don't have it down to the dollar because I can remember uh, whole numbers, but it's very hard for me to remember to the dollar numbers. As always, I uh, cite my sources as much as possible. You can always contact me after if you uh, would like to uh, know exactly what those sources are. But I think for the most part, uh, almost every single data point I'm gonna uh, share is from the census.gov website. 
uh, if you don't know, they do the census every 10 years, but they have a lot of predictions and they do the, uh, the, what's it called? So the American Community Survey that they do uh, every, I think it's like every few, two to three years, they try to do it where it's not the full census, so it doesn't have as large of a population size, but it, it kind of gives a good prediction of what the numbers are going to look like. So um, let me start with some data about Petaluma. Most all this data, I think all the data I'll tell you, I wanted to compare Petaluma to the state of California. We know California is a very large state. I did not break it down compared to the county because I felt for this show it was a little bit more uh, significant to compare it to the state based on the topic. And I didn't even I didn't even um, start with that, but it's it's basically a commentary on the economics and the impact on individuals living in a suburban town like Petaluma that went from a farm town to a suburban town for San Francisco um, and how rapidly that's changed over the years and how now it's impacting the populations that not have not only have been here for a long time, but that are coming in um, because it has a pretty significant uh, impact. So let's get our data started because I know everyone loves data, but these are some pretty easy data points. So the median household income, so let me start by, I was thinking about this on my drive home when I was trying to regurgitate all the statistics I had written down earlier and left <laughs> in Mendocino County. So, but it occurred to me that I should probably define median. So uh, there's a significant difference between median and average. So median is, uh, the best way to explain it is the, the largest number of reoccurring numbers in the middle of a data set. So uh, basically, if there's, uh, for some reason, the number 41, if there's 10 41s in a data set, but then there's only like two 42s and three 43s, then um, 41 becomes the median outcome. And then sometimes you do average, but I don't want to get into the weeds about that. And then average is, of course, just the total numbers divided by the number of data sets. So if you have 100 numbers, you'd add them all together and then you divide it by 100. So the reason that median is used in a lot of contexts is because, and averages can be used in some contexts, it depends on the data set, but we use medians and a lot of wages and, and incomes and actually a lot of public health based data is based on medians. The reason being is that you know, the perfect example that I thought of in the car is that in California, you have the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world that are making multi-billion dollars, who knows, as an individual income. And then you have people that are below the poverty level that are making, you know, less than $20,000 a year. So we call those um, outliers. And I'll talk about actually the poverty rate, which is pretty significant in the state of California. But, you know, the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world are an outlier. So if you're calculating averages, you the, the data can be skewed. And so that's why we use median. Uh, so basically it means that there are several numbers way higher and there's several numbers way lower. So I always just like to make that distinction because sometimes we use averages and statistics incorrectly. So um, that's, I just wanted to start with that so that people understand you. You got to remember back to, what is that, like junior high statistics or so, I don't, I don't even know. Um, so the median household income in Petaluma is $80,000. In the state of California, it's about 67,000. So again, I'm doing a little bit of rounding, but it's, it's not too far off. And the median household price in Petaluma is now $800,000. What was interesting about this number is I was looking and there was several different um, numbers that were out there, but this one I know was reported by the Press Democrat, Argus Courier, uh, Sonoma Media Investments, not too long ago, and I did find ones that were very close. So $800,000 is the median household price. Again, that means that, you know, I live on the west side of town. You talk about a house that's within a few blocks of town and it can be very old and need upgrades and it's like 1.2 to 1.4 million. Uh, and then you have houses that are less than that for purchase. The California median household price is 545,000. So you can kind of see the significant difference there. So I had to calculate 
for myself because, uh, and again, I'll get into this more, but as a millennial, it's almost like a pipe dream for me to own a house in this area. So I, I went through a calculation to see what a household, whether it's individual or two individuals or sometimes three, you know, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, all working, because that's how the household income is calculated. It's everyone in the home that's contributing to the family income. So I had to calculate with a hundred, an $800,000 median household price and a 4.5 interest rate, uh, what it would take, how much you would have to pay per year in order to own a home, but that's, that's that price. So it's about $28,000 a year um, to own a home that's that price. And this is also pending that you have really good credit so you can get that 4.5 APR. And that doesn't include insurance or taxes. So um, that's really significant uh, consideration. So if you have a median household, an annual median household income of $80,000 and a median household price of $800,000, which is asking people to pay $28,000 per month um, in payments. And again, it, it varies based on your down payment. So I took this based on no down payment, but you know, most people have, I don't know, between a three and 10% down payment now. I know some people in home loans that can correct me, but so again, it would decrease it if you had, you know, an $80,000 down payment. But I think most people that are making $80,000 in median household income are not making that kind of down payment. Maybe they've saved for years. Um, but so basically, Without considering the down payment, you're asking people to pay, I don't know, between fifteen and $28,000 a year on an $80,000 a year income, which is only leaving you with, you know, between fifty five and $65,000 uh, to to live. And, that, and, that, and again, this isn't really based on family size. This is the median household income. So your household could have five kids, could have two kids, it could have no kids. This is just the median household income. So that is a significant amount of money <laughs> to do that. Um, so the median age in Petaluma, I thought was, uh, so when I was growing up, it was an older population. However, there were in the adult population, however, there was a very large population under the age of 18 because uh, it makes sense. There's a lot of families here. I think that's pretty well known. So now the median age is 41.6, so just about 42, and the state uh, median age is 36. And um, so, and I did want to bring up, I was looking at home prices in 2008 to 2009, but the, the housing crash happened in 2009, so I provided both numbers, but the median household price in Petaluma in 2008 was $600,000. And so in 10 years, it's gone up uh, $200,000. And in 2009, it was at a low of 305000 during the housing crisis. So I think that this is significant because people that lost their houses during the housing crisis, even, I mean, if they, and a lot of people are subject to short sales because if you bought your house in 2008, just for example, in 2008 for $600,000 and you can only sell, uh, sell it for 305000 the next year, you are going to have a very significant short sale on your house. And so then 10 years later, if you can recover that fast from it, you know, you're asking people to pay $800,000 um, for a house. And, uh, and that doesn't even mean it's a turnkey home, relatively not. So a lot of money generally has to be put into it. So the median household income in Petaluma is uh, projected to be in 2021, $87,000 which, and, and we've seen a 12.3% uh, increase in five years. So statistically, that, that may not sound super significant, but that is a really significant increase uh, in household income over those kind of years. The poverty level in Petaluma is 8.86%, which is, I think I calculated it was 5,100 people in Petaluma live below poverty. I wanted to add that the individual, so for an individual, and this is based on federal poverty level, an individual uh, living under poverty, I believe is $13,500 right now. Um, so you have to live below that level to fall into the federal poverty level. So again, if you're talking about living in Petaluma and making less than 13000 as an individual, it's pretty much, I don't know how people do it, to be honest with you. 
So the state poverty level, this is really interesting actually to me. So they say it to be between 15 and 20,000, uh, 20%. So uh, the Census Bureau adjusts, they do special studies to adjust poverty based on, uh, you know, standard of living. So they raise the poverty level basically based on where you live. So it's 20%. With the raised uh, poverty level that, again, they consider standard of living, but it was still, I think it was still only $30,000 for a family of three per year. Um, and then 15% without it being adjusted. So, clearly Petaluma is about half the average, but there's still a, a significant level of people living under the poverty level. Again, in a city where you, the median household income is $80,000 a year and you can only buy a house for 800000 And I didn't look up rentals, which I wish I did. Um, and uh, I wish my other device wasn't dead so I could. But I didn't look up average rental prices, but they're very high. All these numbers were incredibly high before the fires. And then we have the fires. And I do have people that watch out of state or out of country, but I think they're pretty well in tuned with... Um, the impact of the fires. Uh, last I heard, we lost 6,500 structures, homes, and commercial properties, or they were damaged, whether they were burnt to the ground. So that has increasingly made the rental market, uh, I mean, it was already unbearable, and now it's incredibly unbearable. And so it's forced a lot of people to leave the area, uh, especially if they're renting and lost all their property and didn't have renter's insurance. Uh, so that, it's made it very, very difficult and, and really the bottom line for me is that the cost of living is really rapidly increasing while the wages are stagnant. Um, for the most part, there's very few high paying wages in the county of Sonoma. And uh, I, that is somewhat subjective of me to say, but you can tell, uh, you can tell when you start looking, I always use governmental jobs as kind of an earmark. Uh, of course it's different based on the county and the income, but really you can kind of see the significant differences when you look at governmental jobs. Cause they, you know, in the state of California, there'd be some sort of algorithm based on, you know, the income of the, the city or county. And I think a lot of people would agree with this, that we're seeing this crazy increase in cost of living, but we're not seeing a significant increase in wages. Um, to address these issues, which is why people, you know, almost 90% of people are in Pelham are living under, under poverty. And even, you know, uh, I was talking to someone about it yesterday about how there's no more middle class. You know, there's the poor and then there's the upper class and uh, in the Bay Area and especially in the North Bay. So it's becoming increasingly inaccessible to live here. Uh, and at, at the same time, it's, it's you know, it's not that easy to like uproot your entire life and move away. So I wanted to add, uh, and I did an entire show about living as a millennial in the country, but I wanted to add a, some tidbits about living while a millennial in, in this context, because there are uh, specifics here that are important. So. We know that millennials have a ridiculously high student loan debt across the board. Um, and I kept kind of reiterating during the show that I talked about being a millennial as we had a, a very poor lower education and a forced higher education. So we were told that we had to get our bachelor's degree, but uh, the school system across the country is really poor. And then in California, it's really poor. The lower education system is, is just not good. It's really, really not good. For a state like this, uh, it's quite embarrassing. So uh, the other thing is that uh, millennials make less than our parents for doing the same job. So, and that's a fact. I don't have, I have my notes here, but I'm not going to sift through them to do the different, uh, to state the differences. But it is a fact that millennials make more money for doing the same job that their parents did. And, uh, and a lot of the research shows that we would just like to, and I know millennials were seen as entitled and all that kind of stuff, but we have to accept that they're living on less money in a way higher standard of living across the country. Um, and so that's an important fact. So bringing it back to Petaluma, uh, well, I was sharing data about Petaluma, but I think there's some really important factors. And, and this is kind of where my, my commentary starts and I always joke I hate to be brash, but I don't hate to be brash. I'm going to be honest um, about my experience over the last 22 years. And, uh, you know, I, again, I'm not, I'm not going to 
talk about tubs on stilts and uh, you know the Petaluma Animal Services contracts because one of which has already been decided the the Animal Services contract and I've been pretty open about my opinion about tubs on stilts. I think we have other important issues to address today, but uh, for the comedic value, I wanted to add that. So we have a, uh, it's so crazy to me to think about, but uh, general plans, the city does general plans every 20 years. And so it's basically a plan for the following 20 years. And it's a huge document that addresses so many different areas in the city's development, monetary spending, budget, you know, everything. It's really, really significant of a document. So when I was in high school, I uh, actually, as a part of the teen council, when it existed, was a uh, we were actually asked to comment on the general plan. And we actually had focus groups with the city, like, you know, on behalf of the city council where we had a moderator that actually got our input, uh, input on how, how we wanted to see youth and teens addressed in the general plan across the board and what services should be provided and all that kind of stuff. So now here we are. The current plan expires in 2025 and uh, the the talks about it will start in uh, 2022-ish. I say ish because we don't know, but I have to say that I think the I like to call it the pre-planning years and this upcoming election. I think this will be really significant because the people that we vote into office come November, I think will have a pretty large impact in this pre-planning period for the strategic plan. And I also feel like they will somewhat uh, impact who is involved in the strategic strategic plan uh, development. And so uh, I hope to see a little bit more community involvement. I hope to see the same kind of youth and teen involvement that we had when I was in high school and in the years leading up to that, it was 2003, 2004, where we were asked for our opinion as 15, 16, 17 year olds. And I think that's a really powerful thing. I always say that uh, I started a uh, social entrepreneurship and civic engagement program in Marin City for high school students. And I said one time when I was talking about it in a speech in front of 350 people, terrifying, uh, that, you know, the youth are not the leaders of the future, they're our leaders now. And if you just listen to them, they have many of the answers that we're looking for. They just need a voice to do it. And, and it's not just a voice to do it, it's being able to be transparent and for them to really be honest about you know, how they feel about living in Petaluma, for example, or, and, and the adversity they see and caring about other populations that have more adversity than they do. And, you know, addressing the fact that there is poverty and there is, you know, and that's something that I know we have our youth commission, but when I was on the teen council, it was a very, you know, uh, social advocacy, public policy, social justice focus for us, because we wanted to address not only the teen needs in the city, but uh, also representing perhaps those teens that didn't have a voice. And so uh, I just posted about it because um, I was, I commented on my Facebook, this was not my public Facebook, but I basically commented about the uh, Petaluma High School Val Victorian whose uh, mic was cut off at her graduation ceremony. And I am hoping so much to get her on my show in the next uh, month, so I'm looking forward to that if I can get some over time. She seems really busy, as expected. So, um, but I made a pretty significant commentary on the fact that uh, we've been censored for quite some time as youth in the city of Petaluma, and even when I was really involved in that general plan process, part of the issue was that. Uh, one of the things is that at the time, Petaluma was one of the most conservative cities in Sonoma County. I know that's really hard to believe now. Really, really hard for people to believe. But that is the life that I grew up in. And we uh, wanted to start a teen clinic, a teen health clinic, a, a reproductive health family planning clinic in our teen center. So we used to have a teen center uh, next to the fairgrounds. And uh, we wanted to put it there because we have this audience and we knew that we could potentially 
reach people. Uh, they originally had it on the uh, Casa campus and they nipped that in the butt. And I don't want to get into all the politics of that situation, but um, they would not allow us as a city to have it at the uh, teen center. Uh, which for me personally, as someone that has always been an advocate for family planning, I was really upset. I was really, really upset about it. And so luckily there was a partnership with the Phoenix at the time. And a lot of people don't know this history. I feel like they got like parts of the history. Uh, because I know that I've been knocked for it before, like as a teen council member. I got to tell you a story now. I digress, but I have to tell you a story. I interviewed for a job out of my master's program at 25 and it happened to be that the executive director of that agency, it was a women's health clinic out of Sacramento. And she actually called me out saying that I wasn't committed to the cause because I didn't insist that it be at the teen center and then it was moved to the Phoenix. And so, and, and there were people working there that had been there since high school and I had given up and I had moved on. She said that to me in an interview. I was shocked, I was shocked. Talk about feminism going way wrong because I went away to college and then I went away to grad school to get my master's in public health. This is something I've been passionate about since I was very young. Um, and so I was super shocked when that happened. But, so to tell the whole backstory and what I tried to tell her, I stood up for myself. Of course I didn't get that job because I stood up for myself. But I basically said that we did everything we could within our power to get that clinic, either at Casa Grande or at the teen center. And the city said, absolutely not. They said, we will not fund it. We will not support it. So that is why it's at the Phoenix. And I'm very happy that the Phoenix took that on. It's a great opportunity for teenagers. And that's a kind of a neutral place uh, for teens to go and not have to worry about, you know, privacy and all those kind of things. So that was kind of the struggle at the time is that Pelham was really conservative. We only had abstinence education in our high school classrooms. Uh, we weren't allowed to learn about really a lot of the, and we're talking, I was in high school, I graduated in 2004. So we're not talking that long ago. Um, but there was this religious group that impacted the state saying that we can only have abstinence education and you couldn't teach about. So we learned about like cancer and childbirth and this agency called this nonprofit called free to be. I'll never forget. It's about being a born again virgin and all this kind of stuff. So that's what I got in my high school sex ed classes. I didn't learn anything about, uh, STDs, STIs or using protection or any of those kind of things. When I was in high school, luckily I you know, had a family and a mom that worked in, uh, women's health clinics the whole time I was in high school. So anyway, that's a semi digression, but what's interesting about the post I made about that censorship. And I have to add, I just learned yesterday that a lot of people's argument was that the administration said if she strayed from her original speech, they were going to cut it okay, I mean, I find it hard to believe that a Val Victorian would like really go off in a really offensive or crazy way. But even if that was the case, what they did is that her original, uh, when she reiterated her speech on YouTube, I think it had 330,000 views. She had shown, um, uh, I'm trying to find, she also did so she showed how it was and it was one of on her friends I think it was on one of her friends iPhones they showed her speech and then when it got cut off and then after that she did um the rest of the speech after they cut it off well I found out that the school or the st school district went back to the YouTube videos that had been posted including the ones that her friends posted about when I got cut off and they uh stated it was copyright fraud and so those videos got taken down so she then had to um, post another video basically saying, well, those ones got taken down, so now I have to post a new video. So that's where it goes too far. Even if you can rationalize the argument that, you know, they told her that she could not stray from her speech and therefore she cut it. But for them to go that far where they went on YouTube and claimed it was all copyright fraud so that all of those videos were taken down way, 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 way too far, school and district. That is a blatant hit at the First Amendment. And again, she didn't, she wasn't using any profanity. She wasn't doing anything crazy. She was very responsible about it. Um, and so again, I'm really, really hoping to uh, expand this conversation very much with her. So I hope to have her on here this month, especially before I start, uh, uh, 
interviewing. And that's kind of my big push to interview the school board. So let me get back to this. Again, it's, it's relevant. I think all of this is really relevant. So because, and I get back to why I brought this up, is that the general planning process is going to start again in 2020, uh, 2022. And I think the current administration that we vote in there is going to be integral to this development and pre-planning. And also deciding who's going to be involved. Like, I think that's the biggest thing is deciding who the stakeholders are and making, like, my biggest passion is to make sure that the teenagers have a very productive and strong role in that process. And at the time we did, because we had this huge opinion based on everything we had experienced with our goals uh, to do that. And that teen tenor doesn't exist anymore. We used to issue work permits. We used to do to tutoring and mentoring. And I wrote my first uh, donation letter as a youth council, a teen council member when I was 15 years old. That is an invaluable skill that I use now uh, and, you know, for a lot of money and make a lot of money. And it's been a skill that has been invaluable to me in a lot of ways. Um, and I learned really young, so I got a knack for it really young. I knew how to talk to donors. I knew how to write donation letters. I helped writing grants. Uh, and again, those are the kind of skills that I'm gonna get into. It. We, youth now need more of those vocational skills so that they can stay in an area like this. Not only can they stay, they can serve an area like this. Without those really vocational applied skills, they're not gonna be able to stay here. Um, and that's really unfortunate because this is a great place to live. I love living in Petaluma. It has everything to offer. You still have that community, that small town vibe, but it's becoming unbearably expensive and crowded. And uh, now is where the brashness comes in because I'm just going to start getting into my commentary. And, you know, all the people that I talk to a lot know where my stance is. And uh, I think it's really important because the last part of that post that I posted about uh, when... Uh, the valedictorian speech was cut off, I said that we've been fed kind of this certain kind of information for many years, claiming that it was different than it used to be. But in fact, even though the party changed, the party, it's a nonpartisan city council and mayor is nonpartisan, but we went from conservative to more liberal, same story, different day. Um, and so I really want to call that out very significantly in my commentary. Uh, again, it's a nonpartisan show. It's a nonpartisan election. So I hate that distinction that, oh, well, we're liberal now, so we feel this way. We were conservative before. It has nothing to do with it. Basically, nothing's changed in the city as far as, like, these really hard facts, this culture, this way of thinking. Policy have changed. Roads have changed. Administration has changed. But in my opinion... There's a lot of there's a lot lacking um, in the development and urbanization of this city. So that's my first point is that there's been a severe lack of planning and economic development in this city over the last 20 years, like severe to the point where, in my opinion, it wasn't even addressed. It hasn't even been addressed. Like the city has started these really catchy, you know, uh, it's not even incentives like support of local companies but I have never seen the benefit personally um which again this isn't just based on me so there's 102,000 companies businesses in Petaluma learned that today didn't know that uh a lot of the focus is on brick and mortar and we know based on the infrastructure that a small fraction of those companies are brick and mortar uh, so we're talking about a lot of non-traditional companies, most uh, non-traditional, I shouldn't say they're non-traditional, but I feel like they're non-traditional based on what Pelham focuses on, which is their brick and mortar. There's nothing wrong with that. So when I say brick and mortar, I'm talking about boutiques, restaurants, uh, you know, um, salons. And again, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with those kind of companies, but that's really what the economic development teams focus on, teams, promotion focuses on Pelham is the brick and mortar. Okay. Well, out of 102,000 businesses, they, I cannot imagine a majority of them being brick and mortar. Um, and I assume I call them micro businesses. I call my company a micro business because small business is defined as either under 100 and 500 employees. There's been a culture shift that small business is defined as less than 100 employees, but that's not really a small business. Like that, in my mind, that's a bit, especially in Petaluma, that's a large business in my mind. If you have 100 employees, like I'd call a small business 20, 10 to 25 or less. And so that's why I call myself a micro business um, because I don't feel like I benefit from a lot of the small business incentives nationwide. 
And California is a terrible place to own a company. It's, I'm sorry, it's terrible. It's so expensive. Um, and so I feel like because of this lack of planning and foresight that there was going to be urbanization of Petaluma based on urban sprawl from San Francisco and other parts of the Bay Area that we're in our current situation. Um, and that's a really unfortunate thing because I think that part of it is that we all want Petaluma to keep its charm and to keep its community, but this holding on to the fact that it's going to be the same way it was 15, 20, 25, 30 years ago is dead. It's dead. I'm sorry. It's dead. Like, places change. Things change. Cities changed. And now we have a lack of infrastructure uh, to really support these businesses and people that live here. So... There is a huge, while the city always mentions that there is really high occupancy rates in commercial properties, what they don't explicitly say is that there is very little small office space. So when we're talking about these small and micro businesses, uh, there is not a lot of accommodation for them. So a lot of people can work from home and then we have a growing and co-working places. But again, that doesn't always work for a business owner um, in order to run out of co-working space or a, uh, you know, or home. And so those are major considerations. And then the, uh, what they also don't, uh, mention is that there is a huge turnover in the brick and mortar, like really significant turnover. And it really, uh, is uh, highlighted in different districts in Petaluma. So that's something that people don't want to mention, but we kind of know, we just know. I mean, I we live here. You walk through certain pace of town. It's a new restaurant, new salon every other day. And I'm just using those examples. It's, but again, I think I, I make a distinction with brick and mortar than, you know, other types of companies. So they, they want to admit that. They want to talk about that. Uh, there's a huge lack of incentive to run a company here. Again, running a company in California is also very difficult and very expensive. Uh, I would honestly rather pay more taxes as a Petaluma based owner if there was more return. So I have to pay, I have to pay my state taxes. I'm an S Corp, so I have to pay my state taxes. Uh, I don't have to pay federal taxes right now, but there are other corporations that do. I uh, have to pay my business license, which is way too low. And I'm, I'm the first person to say it. it should be way more than it is. And, but again, I want to see the return. And then I also have to pay a downtown business tax, which again, I would rather pay way more. Um, that actually, that business tax is higher than the city's business tax in general. Uh, but, and it, it does, it leads to, you know, development in the downtown and increased patrol and all these kind of things. But when you look at the total number that it's supporting, the total amount, it's, God, I think it's like $100,000 maybe. I rather pay more to actually see a return on that investment than to pay this money and really feel like it's not serving me as a downtown business owner. I rant and rave about the Keller Street Garage constantly because I don't even feel safe parking in there at night and I'm paying this money as a downtown business owner. So why not pay more? Um, and I don't even want to get into the fact that, uh, let me, I'll mention it later if I get to it. But uh, again, I rather pay more to feel safe in the downtown area where my office is and, and be able to walk to a garage that's clean and safe and I don't feel like something's gonna happen to me at night walking over there. Um, and there's really limited long-term parking there. So, and the city holds accountable for every new business that, that grows to have parking for it and yet the city itself won't take care of its city, city parking. So, and Again, the other thing that's not addressed is the huge number of commuters um, because people can't afford to work, even though there's 102,000 businesses in this city, the wages that are required in order to live here comfortably are way too low. And that's across the board in Sonoma County. So people, many, many people commute to San Francisco, Marin County, East Bay, Berkeley, Oakland, uh, which again, presents a whole, you know, you can talk about the environmental impact, the health impact, the stress income, uh, impact, the, the time it takes you to drive back and forth. I used to commute to Southern Marin every day for three years, and it would take me an hour and a half, two hours, two and a half hours sometime each way, and that's a really, <laughs> it's a really crazy thing uh, to have to deal with every day, and, you know, I don't have kids and stuff, so I can't imagine 
having kids and having to, I mean, my parents did it, Marin in San Francisco, and it's only gotten worse. But that's time you're away from your family. That's time you're away from your community. That's money you're not spending in your own community because you're commuting from other places. And so that's a really significant thing. Um, and so, of course, everyone's been talking about the road quality and transportation issues for as long as I can remember. Uh, the roads here are terrible. Um, it's going to take a lot of money to fix them. And we have uh, transit. Our transit, I, I love public transit here, but it's underutilized. And then, uh, you know, our cross town kind of availability to cross town is uh, quite congested. And so I'm not, I'm not supporting one thing or the other, but the transportation and the roads have to be addressed. Uh, I'm tired of talking about it. It's been like 25 years and the roads are like some of the worst I've ever seen, um, across the country. So, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of a big deal. Uh, I don't even want to get into it because everyone's like, oh, roads are a hot topic issue in the city council. They've been a hot topic issue for as long as I can remember. <laughs> um, so, of course, I like to focus more on the solutions. I always, I always say that you can't properly fix a problem if you don't understand how it started really intimately. And I think we've seen that in our country pretty prominently right now is that there's this idea that you can solve problems without knowing or not addressing how they were started. Uh, and so I think that that's a big issue right now. Um, and you know, I'm really biased to people that uh, are running for office in Petaluma, whatever kind of, you know, Petaluma, Sonoma County, whatever office type it is, I prefer someone that has lived in the area for a long time and I'm making the assumption that they know more about the history than someone that had just moved here. And I'm not saying that that's necessarily true or a fact, you know, not every time someone that's lived here for a long time. But I do think there's something valuable about living in an environment and watching it change firsthand. Because you can look at the statistics, you can hear the history from one person to another. There's, there's going to be a bias. There's something different about being in the environment, watching it change, watching it transform. And those things are really, really valuable to see. So, of course, I've had my show now for a year, and I always come back to this, is that we need new blood in government at all levels. Uh, I always push towards um, supporting younger people to serve because they will be able to serve the up-and-coming demographic. So, the average age right now in Parliament, as I said, is 41.6, but the millennial generation right below that is growing very quickly. They are the main driver of the market currently in the United States, and they also are the main driver of elections if they would get up and go vote. Um, and so I just believe that younger people that are in office can relate better to the main demographic and market that's out there uh, because we all, you know, my generation wants to see change. They want to see positive social impact. They want to see things change. I mean, the national election has shown it all. People want to change. And now the backlash is even more significant for change. But we need to get younger people. And I'm not talking about young people. I'm talking about millennials. Like, they're between the ages of, you know, what, 25 and 37, 38 now. Like, we need to get these people out and voting in these elections. The president is important. But these local people that are, again, going to be a part of the general planning process in 2022 in the city of Petaluma, that's going to affect your life so much. If you want to stay in this area, that's going to affect your life more than anything. So if you're not engaged and who's going to be running that process and who's going to be deciding who the stakeholders are and who's going to be deciding, you know, who should be at the table and who shouldn't, that's a really significant thing. Um, and like I said, the demographics are changing significantly. We, we used to have a much older demographic here and it's rapidly getting younger. And so I want to see younger people representing because I know they have my interests, interests in mind because they can relate and I can relate to them. And, and I feel like they'll listen, you know, it's not a, you know, one of my more significant comments here is that I want to get out of, and again, this is a national problem, but you definitely see it local it's getting away from this old boys club handshake culture where, uh, and to that end, I want to see tighter uh, financial procurement standards at the city level, but that's getting into really s uh, significant um, specifics. But, and I was really upset to find, this is my current, uh, one of my current, 
processes is that uh, the Keller Street Garage, the Petaluma Hotel, it's really a long-standing handshake. There's no contract in writing, but uh, there is a, an understanding that they are able to rent 30 parking spaces in the Keller Street Garage. I believe I calculated it. Uh, it's, I want to say it's $7,000 a year, which equals 70 cents a day for 30 parking spots in the long-term parking upstairs. Well, does 30 parking spots seem significant to me? Yes. Uh, I have no problem with the Panama Hotel having that agreement. Um, again, it's a long-term handshake agreement. I have no problem with them having that agreement with the city, but I think that they should be paying over $20,000 for those parking spots to then take care of that garage. Because if you're going to put out business owners, it needs to be worth it monetarily to take care of the garage. And so that's kind of one of my personal things. It's like a little project, but as a downtown business owner, I'm really upset that this handshake has gone on for so long. Um, and they're taking up 30 spots in an area where we have such limited parking. Uh, and, you know, the, the new owner has got the same handshake deal they had before for years prior. And I'm sorry, this is becoming an urban city. So you're going to have to pass that cost on to your uh, people that are staying. You know, I'm sorry. It's I, I don't appreciate. I would pay seventy cents a day to have a parking spot guaranteed in the Cal Street Garage. I'd pay for two permits to have my customers be able to park in downtown, um, and my colleagues and and people to be able to park. You know, we shouldn't have to park all the way in Theater Square because it's safer and it's cleaner and it's privately owned, so it's taken care of. Um, versus our city owned, you know, that I'm paying these taxes to, these downtown taxes, the city taxes too. So. I want to get in the weeds on that one, but that's something I'm, I'm, I care a lot about. And then, uh, and I can send you the 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 uh, specific information I got via email. There's no contract. There's nothing else. It's just uh, on the books. So, the other thing, getting back to getting people to vote, um, Petaluma in the last election only had a 26 percent turnout, and so again. We have this idea that Petaluma is so involved in in issues. Which I always like to point out, that's how a city is supposed to be. You should be involved with what's going on in your city. That shouldn't be something that's remarkable. Uh, it's the way it should be. Um, but that being said, a 26% turnout, and these are of registered voters. This isn't, you know, just of the population in general. That's pretty upsetting to me that only 26% of the registered voters voted in this election this past election. Um, and I think in the midterm that we had uh, in the last November election for mayor and city council, that also had around a 25% turnout rate. Uh, and, and again, for a city that claims to be so involved and so there is something missing here. And uh, regardless of whether people agree with me or they don't agree, I want them to get out, I want them to vote, and I want their voice to be heard. Uh, but I would I would ex suspect that a lot of people feel disenfranchised and not a part of what's going on here in Petaluma because I think there's a lot of prominent voices and um, it's becoming more diverse but relative to the Bay Area this is not a diverse area and so um, I feel like perhaps people aren't feeling that they're being well represented uh, in the government in leadership in the community so again it gets back to how can we make sure that leadership is, even if they're not relatable to all the populations, um, especially the more like low opportunity populations that perhaps don't feel like they have the same voice, how do we get the outreach to be improved so that we are looking out for their best interests? You know, we don't need a council that's only looking out for the middle and upper middle class interests. We don't need a school board that's only looking out for the middle class, upper middle class interest. Uh, we have a vast population here and all those um, issues need to be addressed. Like I, I just, I don't know. And I think a lot of it has to do with, again, bringing those people to the table. And even if it's not one big table of people, you can't expect them to come to city council meetings. You can't, you need to reach out and uh, make sure that you have a diverse constituency if you want to be on the council. That's how I feel about it. I, I want to see cha significant changes made. I want to see all of the populations, most all the populations represented in the city of Petaluma. I think that that's been a, uh, 
a rough point through this transition for through the urbanization and diversification of the city. Uh, so I think that that's a really significant thing is that, again, I don't want a council that represents just the middle class. It's not even really the middle class. It's like uh, upper middle class and upper class in the city of Petaluma because you have these this major part of the population that's not being represented. Um, and, and again, I would imagine that they don't feel like they really have a voice. I mean, I fight for my own voice because I'm a single person that wants to see these other people be represented regardless of what my income or my socioeconomic status is. I want everyone to have a voice. So, um, and again, this lack of planning and this lack of understanding that diversification and urbanization was going to happen, that was just intuitive. Like, did people really think that the North Bay was going to live in a little bubble for the rest of time? I mean, that's just not rational. So I think that some of the things the city can do, and I'm not saying this is all like the city's issue, but encouragement of vocational based schooling. I know that it's been increased in, in uh, the last few years, but teaching kids again to have leadership skills, but vocational skills so that if they don't want to get their college degree or they decide not to, that they can have those really working hands-on skills. Uh, the city, I would I would like to see the city elevate local nonprofits and resources a lot more. And uh, that doesn't, that's not a, there's a lot of rules about, you know, they can't do X, Y, and Z, but I don't understand why they couldn't link uh, community members to resources that will help. I would like to see uh, the, an increase in outreach from the city to make sure that people are involved in these processes and that they don't feel like they're in the dark, you know, I don't want to sit in a city council meeting, but that doesn't mean that I don't want to know what issues are going to be addressed. And again, I know they post the agendas, I know they post all these things, but more innovative and strategic outreach that really addresses the population that you want to target. Um, in the state of California, there's other places, other government agencies that do it and the, and the city could learn from. I also think this is something I kind of just thought about. I think about these issues quite a bit before I speak to them. I think that we need to rethink our uh, current commissions and committees and how they're set up, uh, their power, and uh, who's appointed to them, um, and perhaps that structure in general. Maybe there's more stringent requirements of who's represented and uh, a more cross-sectoral representation across the committees and commissions. I don't want one commission that's... I use the tech committee as an example again this is an arbitrary example but I know it because I was on there and I was the chair for a while but I don't want a tech committee that's all techies because then you're not getting a cross uh you're not getting a good representation of what the city pedal limit is looking for not only you're not getting a good representation of what they're looking for you're not getting a good representation of what they want and how what they understand about tech infrastructure and I swear we spent half the time talking about conduit I know what conduit is, but frankly, that is not high on my priority list when it comes to tech. When it comes to tech, I believe in accessibility to information, social media, web-based, outreach, making things more accessible, not increasing the bandwidth of internet when a lot of people don't even have internet access in the city or they have really poor internet access. And this increase in speed isn't going to help them because they can't afford the increased speed services. So um, I think we can start rethinking the criteria uh, and getting people interested that are from different points of view and kind of, again, making it more accessible and, and kind of demystifying what the process looks like and stop alienating people that might have a certain passion or skill set, but not the other to still be involved. So um, in closing, because I'm already running out of time and I didn't even get through anything I wanted to talk about. I, 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 I love this word and I hate it at the same time. The word innovation and entrepreneurship, uh, they're very much overused and abused at times. Innovations and entrepreneurship are now hot words that are used all over the place, especially by government. And the problem with these buzzwords being used is that in a lot of government agencies, they actually haven't broken down the bureaucracy, which is the main barrier to social entrepreneurship. And social entrepreneurship, I should define that, is not people are always like, oh, like social media. Social entrepreneurship is believing on impacting populations, individuals, communities in a positive way. So whether you're, and most people understand the green energy, social entrepreneurship. So whether you're in green energy, 
or public health, you believe in impacting populations in innovative ways and taking advantage of opportunities to do so. That's a social entrepreneur. I'm a social entrepreneur. That's why I'm here trying to distill down these issues and help people mitigate the system. And you can always ask me questions, uh, email me. That's the best way to reach me. Um, and, uh, just if you go to my, if you're watching me on Facebook right now, you can go to my, um, Facebook page and send me a private message. And then if you're listening online, you can email me at D G at M A B E R M E dot com. And I'm always happy to help link people with resources, uh, you know, help. I was explaining the, the, the public bid contracting process for most government agencies. I'm always happy to share that information. That's one of my passions. That's one of the reasons I'm a social entrepreneur because I was gifted with a certain skill set um, and I want to share that information because uh, I'm very lucky. I, I, was, I was able to, um, you know, develop skills to be an analyst, but to also be able to communicate uh, across sectors, across, you know, communities and really help people understand that process so they can get involved. My bottom line is I want people to be involved. I think that individuals in the community have the greatest power to transform their own community. Um, that's the power is that when people are involved in their own communities, that's where the change happens because, and even if I'm working in a different community, that's not my own. I have the same, uh, sentiment is that I want to help train and empower the people in that community to serve their own community. That is what power comes from. That is what change comes from. Um, it's not about me going in and saving the community. It's about helping that community serve their own um, and see make change. That's how change is made. You know your community better. I know Petaluma really well. I've been here for over 22 years. Um, but then in other communities, we know them. So I'm always hoping that if people have questions, reach out to me. I'm very happy to explain. Um, I usually do at some point give my endorsements for uh, the elections, but I don't. I don't really like to do that because I don't want people to rely. I don't want them to look to me to vote based on my endorsements. I rather help people make their own decisions, whether they agree with me or not. That's what I want you to do. I want you to be able to um, look at the information, make your own decisions, and I'm happy to help anyone through that process. Like I said, you don't need to agree with me. You don't need to, you know... Um, you want to be on my side. I don't want people to vote based on my endorsements. That's not at all what I want. That's completely counterproductive to what I'm trying to do. So again, in closing, I think one of the main focuses, this is kind of my shout out, uh, my call out of everyone that's running for local office is making sure that people, uh, all the candidates get people to vote. We don't want this same thing happening over and over and over again. Like, we don't. I don't want to see that. I want, and again, I realize that people have to be encouraged to vote. They have to know how. They have to feel like it's going to impact change, which it does. I'll say it over and over. It really impacts change. Like, you've got to, you know, if I was running for city council, and keep people keep asking me to, I'm not going to right now. If I was going to run for city council, that would be my main focus is getting people to vote and again regardless of if they agreed with me or not I want you to get out and be involved because through that that's how change happens like I said again even if they don't want to vote for the same council members as me even if they don't want to vote for the same mayoral candidate than me that is how change happens is people getting involved and uh, we need it across all ages we need it across all demographics we need it across all socioeconomic statuses so that we have people involved in the city 26 percent turnout of registered voters that's for a city that's so involved, like, that's not good. That's not a good turnout rate. That's, I mean, you know, that's just not, and we need to give people the resources to vote. And then, again, like, you can't really complain um, unless you get people to vote. Like, you need that kind of support. So, uh, in closing, I got to get out of here. I'm in my last minute, and I got to do my close of my hour. Like I said, you can always um, send me questions over. Please stay tuned for more information about my... Uh, interviews with upcoming um, people that are running for hopefully school board, council, and mayor. And I am signing out. Again, you are watching or listening to State of the Union with DG the 30-something. Thank you so much for joining me. And you are listening to